Okay, so welcome everybody to the uh, fourth um, course or lecture of the course series on uh, Jets and Atlas. Today we're going to talk about the uh, inputs to that finding. So we move away from phenomenology to actually more detector experimental oriented issues. Um, what I wanted to start with is something I actually was hoping I could show you uh, last week, but it just didn't, uh, didn't work out time-wise. So I'm talking about it today. And that is a signal formation in the liquid argon calorimeter of the Atlas experiment, which is a part of the early stage pile of suppression strategy of this experiment. Then we move on to topological cell clusters, the basic signal definition that we use in Atlas to represent our calorimeter signal. I'm pretty sure we won't get into particle flow. So um, we have to catch up that up probably um, tomorrow. So let's recap quickly what we uh, discussed last time. So we uh, talked a little bit about the underlying event, the multi-parton interactions mostly that happens uh, when other partons from the same two protons that we actually, which actually carry the heart sc scattering interaction collide. Uh, those are mostly soft collisions. Uh, they're largely independent of the hard scattering. There are models that predict the color reconnection between the hard scattered and the soft uh, partons. But as far as I know, there's no direct experimental conf confirmation of this effect. Uh, there are some indirect hints, uh, especially because the parameters we use for this reconnection model are uh, powerful in tuning the final state to what we observe in the experimental data, the soft final state. Uh, we talked about pileup, the particles generated by additional proton proton collisions at the same time as the uh, signal collision happens in the same bunch crossing. Um, this is an effect of the high total cross section and proton proton collisions and the high intensity of the beams at LHC. Uh, we have up to 60 and more additional collisions in R2 at the end of R2. Those are also mostly soft. Uh, the final states emerging from those basically cover the same phase in terms of uh, pressure flow and uh, momentum, transverse momentum as the underlying event. Um, these processes are completely independent of the hard scattering process. Uh, and considering their relatively large number per bunch crossing, they represent a somewhat diffuse scattering of particles into the, into the detector, and they will thus contribute to the uh, jet measurement. We talked about the most important pile-up suppression uh, technique that is used these days, the jet area-based approach, where the uh, measurement of the median transverse momentum density um, is done event by event, and thus gives us a level of the pile-up activity in this event. Um, it is then converted into a Transverse momentum using the jet area and subtracted from the jet, um, and thus we get the uh, we get the corrected transverse momentum of the jet. And if this then is above the analysis threshold, we will keep the jet and consider it pile up corrected. So today we're going to talk at first a little bit about pile up in the Atlas liquid argon calorimeter. So moving away from the particle level into the detector. And uh, for all calorimeters at the LHG, this is a pileup is a severe operational challenge. The large number of proton collisions in each bunch crossing every generated every 20, 25 nanoseconds uh, have to be dealt with somehow in the detector. There are several approaches. Um, the CMS uh, detector experiment has a, a very fast short signal integration time. And so has the Atlas uh, tile calorimeter actually, which is only sensitive to two to three bunch crossings around the signal bunch crossing. Liquid, uh, the Atlas experiment employs a large liquid argon calorimeter, which has a lot of advantages in terms of stability and radiation uh, uh, survivability, but it needs more time to get the signal out. So it's much more sensitive to the pileup. And today I will sketch, give you an idea um, what we have done about this to reduce the sensitivity. Oops. 
So if I look back to the uh, liquid argon sampling calorimeter that we employ, we have uh, the well-known feature in these kind of detectors is that the current generated in the liquid argon by the particles created in the showers of the, uh, which are in turn generated by the incoming particles, is a triangular uh, current. It's characterized by a baseline called TD. This is a drift time. That's the time an electron needs to, to travel the whole uh, depth or whole gap width, as we call it, of the liquid argon. And the formula gives you the formula of a triangular pulse shape uh, for the current. If you have a uh, typical operational field of one kilovolt per millimeter in, in the liquid argon, you need about 400 to 450 nanoseconds in the outlast calorimeter to collect the charges. Only the forward calorimeter is uh, quite fast. It has very thin uh, layers of argon, so it's only 50 nanoseconds to get the charge out of that one. With a bunch of crossings of every, every 25 nanoseconds, you can immediately see that the signal is, uh, while the signal is collected, other signal may easily add, be added, uh, even from, under, from other bunch crossings. So we don't only have to pile up in time. That happens at the same time as the collision of interest. We also have actually effects on the pile up in time by the pile up out of time, as we call it, which is the energy or the residual signal from previous bunch crossings. And as we will see also from the following bunch crossing. So we deal with this by trying to not integrate the triangular pulse, which is a classic way of reading out a calorimeter. You measure the charge that is uh, generated in the gap. It's a very precise uh, measure for the deposited energy. But uh, instead you only look at the current in a, in a very, very narrow window of time to measure the current amplitude, which is also proportional to the incoming energy, but is subject to much more fluctuations uh, than the actual whole integral. So let's have a look at pile up in the calorimeter. So if you uh, imagine pile up in the calorimeter, every 25 nanoseconds, you have a signal coming into a calorimeter cell, generating a triangular current. And here I just drew a little example with randomly, sec uh, randomly selected amplitudes of currents for a window of uh, 1.2 uh, microseconds. So this is, this is how, what actually happens in the electrode of the liquid iron calorimeter. And of course, the net effect is this is, is the sum of all of this. And you see there's two components to the sum. There's the high frequency of, uh, oscillation, um, which, which comes from, the, from a new peak every 25 nanosecond and the low frequency operation, uh, oscillations, which indicates the variations of the uh, amplitudes in these bunch crossings. These variations come from very important um, reasons. One is the, uh, the change or the uh, differences in the proton density in the bunches that cross um, that have an effect. The others are just fluctuations in how the final state, the minimum bias final state of the pileup is generated. Not all, not all the time, all cells see energy from particles. Even at uh, uh, 60 or so additional interactions, there may still be some voids in the detector that are not covered. And here you see, this is, this is basically what we see as a full history. Now, if we, are, uh, we can get rid of the, of the DC level of this see, uh, by just doing, the, uh, doing an AC coupled signal extraction to the amplifier. This is done in ATLAS, and actually the, the low frequency oscillations are taken care of at this part, at this step also, but I left them in here for illustration. Um, I did not fold in the actual operational parameters of the, of the filter. And here you see um, the fluctuations in this, in this sample or in, in this uh, time range can give, give you a noise, give you a, can be expressed as a, a fluctuation uh, of the signal when there's actually no energy in the calorimeter. And this is seen, uh, this is indicated here by the level. So we have the one sigma, two sigma, three, that's the four sigma noise level. Um, and of course, the, um, the higher, the, I mean, the larger fluctuations are more rare than the, than the uh, 
smaller fluctuations, small amplitude fluctuations. Okay, so we have the, uh, this is the signal if you have nothing in the calorimeter, just the fact that you're running the experiment and the pileup happens. So now if we add a, this one particular one starts at 400 nanoseconds and it's about 450 nanoseconds long. It's a, a drift time of about 400 nanoseconds, 450 nanoseconds. Um, then the actual signal that arrives at the amplifier and that has to be uh, amplified and shaped and so forth is actually the addition of these two curves. So I, I, I made a particularly unlucky choice in this illustration because the peak of the, uh, of the true signal has actually not changed much uh, because I'm in a, in a valley of a low frequency oscillation here. Uh, but you can imagine that the fluctuations that are in this pileup component uh, transfer directly to the peak of this, of this current pulse and make it oscillate as well. That is what we actually call the pileup noise. So this is um, unsuppressible, it's, it's just there. It's uh, proportional to the number of proton interactions we have per bunch crossing uh, in, in such that it's actually depends on the square root of that number. So that's, that's a basic principally dependence of the noise on the, on the number of collisions we have in the machine per bunch crossing. So this is how the signal would look like if you have a smaller signal, you immediately see you add the same noise, the same pileup. This is independent of the actual signal from, from, from an interesting event. Um, and the fluctuations can easily shift your signal into a noise regime. Usually to have a good calorimeter signal, you need to be away uh, at least two or three sigma away from, from the zero reading. So you want to have a good signal to noise ratio. And we will come back to this when we talk about the topological cell cluster. So this is basically the image of what's going on in the, in the uh, liquid argon gap when we are run with pileup. And if you have an even smaller signal, of course, you can easily see it will completely wash, be washed out by noise uh, at some point. So you can now uh, little chart calculated for this uh, example signal. And if the amplitude of the signal would be 10 times the noise, that's the black curve. And if it's four times the noise, that's the red curve. And if it's two times the noise, it's the blue curve. And I show the uh, typical quadratic function for the charge collection with or without pileup. And you see that the pileup actually takes away uh, charges we would, we would collect. And so the biggest problem is that how much it takes away is dependent on the pileup itself. And that makes the signal very unstable because pileup is changing on us all the time. Uh, you probably know that during the eight hour run or so that we have at LHG, the beam intensity drops by a factor of 10 or so, which means the pileup drops by about the same factor. So this is, um, this is an issue. We, we, have, we need something that is stable against the contribution of pileup. So the solution, or here's, the, here's just another plot that shows you the collector charge with pileup minus the collector charge without pileup as function of the collection time. And you see this, this very characteristic uh, wiggles and the loss of the actual charge you would like to uh, have. So the, of course the, the solution to all this is very, very simple. You do not integrate the full current signal. So as I said earlier, we can use the amplitude of the current, the current at T zero, so to say, um, because that is directly proportional to the energy itself in case of electromagnetic showers. So we actually apply an electronic shape of electronically shaped pulse such that we only sensitive to, the, to a very short time. Um, it's a very beginning of the, um, when the particle enters the, uh, the liquid argon. And we try to suppress contributions from the following bunch crossings this way as well. So the strategy here is very simple. We, we, we apply bipolar signal shape that you know, uh, converts the incoming energy into a bipolar shape, which has a net zero integral. And the idea behind that is if that everything that happens in the part of the shape pulse has a weight such that it cancels with everything that happened close to or at the time of the interest, collision of interest. 
such that they both add up to a zero integral. That means that the net average effect of pileup on the signal will be zero. So the way it looks like is uh, on the next slide, you see the uh, triangular current pulse. You see the integration time tau, which is very narrow. It's only 15 to 17 nanoseconds, depending on the region of the detector. And you also see the bunch crossing time, which is 25 nanoseconds. So, of course, this is a real existing electronics. So the um, integration time of the shaper is folded with all the signal modifications that happens when you have to get the, the signal from the cold and the liquid argon out to the preamplifier. There's impedance mismatches. Uh, there's all kinds of signal modif uh, modifications possible. And the real pulse we, we see has actually a rise time of 30, about 35 nanoseconds, but it still reflects only um, 17 nanoseconds of basically opening the, the readout for the current measurement. The electronic circuit then turns it into this green curve. And I marked the little dots on the curve. Those are 25 nanosecond steps. Every, at every of one of these green of these dots, we basically have a readout. So we can, we can read the whole shape if we wanted to. It's some practical and normal operations, but we do it for calibration purposes occasionally. So how does this strategy actually work? So we have this, this shaping function. And the first thing you should probably understand is the orientation along the time axis. Actually, what goes in positive direction of the time axis, this is just a convention on how we, how we, how we plot these things. It's a, it's, a, it's a history, while the, the future is to the left of the peak. So it's, it's a little mind boggling maybe, but that's just the convention and that's how these pile shapes are published. So everything that is to the right of the peak happened is influenced by stuff that already happened, while everything that's left of the peak is influenced by stuff that happened next. We write down a very simple, um, formula to characterize what you actually see. So the measured energy has a, the true energy that you want and some component from pileup. And this pileup component is modified by the integral of the shaping function. And if you assume that there is uh, the average, the same energy is deposited at each of these bunch crossings into this particular calorimeter cell we are looking at right now, then you can come up with this uh, very simple formula which kind of gives, has an integral it was a shaping function, which is, I'm sorry, there's a mistake in the formula. I have to fix that. This, this EB axis should not be there anymore. Um, so this is zero by design of the electronics. And this is not the end of the story because we read only every 25 nanoseconds, we actually have not an integral, but we have a sum. So we have, we read from, the first value we can read is basically two um, is, is two bunch crossings in the future. And then we go along this and have the weights at each of these points. This is for, every, for any good approximation, this is also zero. This is not a non-trivial obs observation. The pile chip had to be highly tuned to make sure that the integral and the sum, uh, the digitized sum have the same net zero contribution. So now we, we ran for the longest time, we ran with 50 nanoseconds. So we had actually more void in our bunches. So we are missing energy deposits every second bunch crossing. And even in this case, if you, if you do the integral, you get very close to zero. So it, it, we still had this effect that the pileup that is added at the time of the collision was canceled out by the history of the collision. Now, if you go to longer, there was at least in the beginning of LSG, we had a longer uh, periods of uh, uh, bunch cross, we had a little longer bunch distances. And the longer you get, the less this works. So my standard answer was always, pileup is not a problem. Pileup is, is a really nice feature. And if you had a continuously running machine, that you would have very little problems with pileup because the cancellation would work best. Unfortunately, there's the other rule that says that the pileup noise rises 
with the number of collisions in the bunch crossing, the square root of the number of collisions in the bunch crossing. So the noise will rise, but the baseline, the energy contribution will be much better uh, corrected than with lack of pileup. So if we go to even wider configurations, you see that this, uh, of course, gets more and more and becomes not true. And if you go to the situation we had uh, at the very beginning, the first data of the LHG, we didn't have any pileup. So any out of time pileup, sorry, should be precise. Because of course we had in time pileup, we still collided bunches. So the signal measure was always just the true energy and the energy from whatever the in time pileup throws at us. So you can, you can uh, summarize this feature if you plot this weight, this effective weight as function of bunch crossing time, the bunch spacing time. And you see that it's pretty good at 25 to 50 nanoseconds. It doesn't quite come out to zero. Um, this is a residual effect of the digitization. This calculation looks trivial, but it's, it's really following exactly what, what we do. It has a uh, digitization model behind it and the correct, um, all the correct parameters for the shaping function. But you see that if you have no pileup, let's say at 600 nanoseconds or so, 600 nanosecond bunch crossing is safe enough to collect to not have the signal affected by pileup, then the actual in-time pileup um, contributes fully to the signal. So, and I'm very sorry, I have to be precise if you say not to be affected by pileup, this is not to be affected by out-of-time pileup because in-time pileup is always there as soon as high, high intensity proton bunches collide. Okay, so this is what happens in the liquid iron calorimeter. So we can expect some respect that we have on average, no contribution from the pileup, the out of time pileup contribution cancels the in-time pileup contribution. There was a design we choose and we tested and it seems to work quite well, except then we decided to collect our signal in the calorimeter in a different way. Um, the topological cell clustering I'm describing now is, this, is, is the basic idea of extracting from the calorimeter for each uh, recorded bunch crossing, the cells that they actually have some energy that, they, that you actually want to use. You know that we have next to or near to 200,000 cells in the calorimeter and most of them have actually no, uh, significant, no significant signal, no signal contributing to the measurement. So we wanted to get rid of those. And we do this by basically forming energy blocks literally three-dimensional energy blobs inside the calorimeter, which start from a seed and they are growing with some control parameter until they're done growing. And then we call them a topological cell cluster with one more step, which I will come to a little later. The, the clustering follows not the signal itself, but the significance of the signal. This is very important. We, we, uh, we are worried about signal or noise and not the absolute signal. So we, have, we follow spatial significance pattern to reconstruct these clusters. And ideally, we think about a calorimeter, ideally what we like to have is that a cluster represents, one cluster represents, for example, a photon or an electron. And they're compact showers and they should be represented by one cluster. For hadronic showers, we have seen this. There may be microscopic, or relative even considerable diff uh, distances between two interactions in the same shower. So you may actually have get, you may actually get uh, one or more uh, clusters depending on what the shower actually did. And we will see this is that this is really happening. The noise we use to build our clusters as uh, without pileup is just the electronic noise, which is very, very small by design. We put a lot of effort into designing the electronics of the calorimeter to have very little electronic noise. And of course, the moment you start the machine with, uh, with really high intensity, you get pileup noise. Now, I told you we have pileup even in 2010 when we, you know, we always say we have no pileup, we have still the in time additional collisions, but those, those are not considered noise because they, they really, there's not the zigzag the sawtooth pattern that we saw when we have 
energy every 25 nanoseconds. Here we have basically energy and then we have a 600 nanosecond or longer break. So it's just an addition to the signal that has to be subtracted. It's not really a noise in the event added by the in-time pileup alone. Only when you have out-of-time pileup getting involved, you add actually a pileup noise component, component, which we had from 2011 on, except for very special ones where we took low, low pileup configurations to understand some features of our signals. We follow uh, a seed and growth protocol. This is pretty classic for calorimeters. Um, the seed, seed cells are required to have at least four sigma uh, significance, while um, the growth is controlled by cell by the signal in cells that neighbor seeds. If they have at least two uh, sigma noise significance. Their neighbors are collected as well. So we have the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, as long as we have cells that have more than two sigma um, significance and are close, uh, close to a seed cell. Then there's a, a final cut for all cells, which just says that the, um, the cell signal should be greater zero. This is basically means there is uh, all cells are accepted that are around cells that have either two sigma significance and are clustered or four sigma significance and starting a cluster or are part of a cluster. All the cells around them will be collected in three dimensions. And that means what, like 28 neighbors in regular space geometry. So all these cells would be collected into a cluster. We also see that there's an absolute amplitude taken. So we also cluster around negative energies, which come from pure noise. Uh, doing this helps a little bit with cancellation of noise inside a cluster. So if you have a mixture of negative energy and positive energy cells inside the cluster, there's actually a little bit of cancellation of the, of the noise inside this cluster. So if you do this, um, you can look when clusters you get. And this is the, the upper plot shows you for uh, some central uh, pions, simulation of single pions in the calorimeter. How many clusters you get for pi knots, which are basically two photons. So you accept something about between one and two clusters. And then for pions, uh, for charged pions, you see this blue uh, distribution, which is a long tail. So you can get up to 10 clusters, for example, for 100 GeV charged pion. This is um, just a reflection of the hadronic shower. We have to. When we, when you, whenever you do grow and collect, um, collect and grow clustering strategies, you may have to split the cluster again because you may have collected too much. There are several strategies. Uh, in my old experiment, we used the gradient. We measured the gradient. So if you, you know, if the energies go down while you cluster and suddenly go up again, we would split. Um, in Atlas, we do it differently. We, we cluster everything first, and then we look if we have local maxima along which we should split the cluster. Again, this is uh, hard to imagine, but it's all in three dimensions. So it happens uh, all around the original energy blob. This avoids that the clusters are getting too big. You don't want the clusters to get so big that they don't allow uh, a good measurement of the energy flow inside a jet anymore. If you, have only, if you collect everything into one cluster, all you get is one four vector. So you want to have a, the best possible image of the energy flow forming a jet. And that means the smallest, smallest possible clusters. So um, here's an example of the clustering in the forward calorimeter of Atlas. So here you see the cells uh, above four sigma. So this is a jet simulated in the forward calorimeter. There was no pileup added uh, in the simulation. So what you see is, is really all the cells that are above four sigma and potential cluster seeds. And if you look at the next uh, picture, this shows you cells that are, uh, and have at least two sigma, and those are part of the growth control of the cluster. They cannot see clusters themselves, but if they're neighboring a four sigma or larger signal, then they can be collected. And if you do this, you get the final picture looks like the one in the lower right corner. This is actually 
a jet, which clusters into, I think, about nine or so, or maybe more clusters. And you see um, there's not a good match between the two sigma picture and the, the final picture. That means that some of these cells that we see in this particular sampling layer of the calorimeter have no neighbors that make them survive. And in other places, you see that they are surviving, but there's no neighbor in the same sampling layer. That just means there's a neighbor in the sampling layer behind it. It's a 3D signal definition. So it will look also for all neighbors, not only the ones in, for example, rapidity and phi. Okay, so you can see the effect on the cells. So this is in, in several different sampling layers of the calorimeter. There is the, uh, in the central barrel, the layer, the first layer. Then there is the, uh, in the end caps, the first layer. And then there, actually those are the second layers if you're really more careful. And then there is the first layer, the hydronic end caps, and then there's one in the FK. And you see the, the blue distribution shows all the cells. This is the, what, what, what is plotted here is the significance of the cell. So it's real data where we plot the signal in the cell divided by the noise expectation for the cell um, in pileup uh, with an average of 28 interactions per bunch crossing. And you see the blue would be all the cells we will get. But if you apply a top topological clustering, the yellow gives you the distribution of the cells that actually survive and you clearly see the two, the four sigma thresholds. You also see if you look very carefully that this distribution to the left looks very Gaussian while to the right it doesn't. The reason for that is that the pileup history, noise is a pileup history has actually a certain level of coherence because it comes from showers. That means the noise between cells that once contained one shower or energy of one shower is correlated. When the one cell had a little higher signal, the other cell had very likely a little higher signal too. So there is a noise component, um, coherent noise component that creates part of the tail. The other part of the tail is that even in these zero bias data, as we call it, the randomly taken data, there may be a little bit of physics left, uh, a little bit of phys physical signals left, that of course will also show up on the right side of the distribution. So if you look at our noise cuts that we use by, with clustering, then they're motivated by Gaussian uh, probability assumptions, right? I mean, you say um, four sigma noise has a very, very tiny likelihood uh, for a cell to have only noise. There's a good, good, good probability the cell has real signal. But this is technically only true for purely Gaussian noise distributions. And these distributions that you see here are not Gaussian. So it's a non-perfect model for uh, making a selection or defining a significance. We tried others, but this is the most practical one that we can come up with. And it's, it's now has held up for 10 years and it will probably, or more than 10 years, and it will probably hold up a little longer. Um, once we have these clusters, you can actually, and in the back of this, there's actually examples how these cluster form and all this stuff. You can browse that at your own discretion. But once we have them, we can actually calculate shapes and moments for them, as we call them. So there's several geometrical features to the cluster that we can calculate. You see a list here. There's actually a, a quite interesting, or I think quite complete, sorry, interesting, I shouldn't say that on our own paper, but um, quite complete paper on topological cell clustering in the, in the calorimeter, which I can only recommend to, to have a look at. It, we're trying to explain everything we do there, and it's um, it, it collects a lot of uh, prescribes how these how these uh, moments are actually calculated and so forth. Uh, we have several classes of moments. We have moments that relate to the signal itself, like the, the uh, energy density of the cluster, the time of the signal when it when it actually um, what the fluctuation is in the time of the signal. The quality of the signal, this is the hardware uh, judgment, the compactness, and so forth. Um, it also has uh, spatial and geometrical uh, moments, radial extensions, uh, first and second moment. Uh, we have actually a normalized and an absolute value for those. Uh, we have the longitudinal extension, the first and second moment, again, normalized and absolute. All this gives uh, give us judgments to judge whether the cluster is likely electromagnetic deposit, meaning compact 
little amount of fluctuations and those relatively small second moments typically, or whether something looks more hadronic, uh, meaning it is it has a different, not so well uh, prescribed shape. As, as you probably know, electromagnetic showers is a very predictable shape. And most important, the longitudinal and the lateral shower uh, spread in electromagnetic showers is, is quite correlated. That's why we can actually also parameterize them in fast simulation quite quickly, quite nicely. Hadronic showers have no such features. So it's a completely different game. So we set up a calibration. And I think that's the last topic I will go through today, um, which makes an attempt to calibrate these clusters where they are. So instead of you know collecting these clusters into jets or into uh, using them to form a particle or whatever, we, we're actually trying to calibrate them first. Now this is uh, if you work with with Atlas jets, you know the famous EM Topo jet. This is a jet where the cluster is taken at, at the electromagnetic scale, so uncalibrated, as we would say. Um, it works very well, but requires large corrections for the jets. We will talk about that next time. The local hadronic calibration, the idea was that we have a certain level of, uh, we're getting closer to the energy deposited at the cluster location, and we're taking care of local losses in inactive materials around the position of the cluster. Um, and we're taking care of losses that come from the clustering itself. The clustering is not perfect. Obviously, we lose true energy and we collect accidentally collect noise. So um, we, we, we try to address this in, in terms of losses. The calibration uses cluster shapes and location uh, because all these effects are dependent on the nature of the shower. So the calibration, for example, with the definition of our basic signal being the electromagnetic scale signal for electrons or photons, this calibration factor is actually safely to be, to be one. There's really nothing more you want to do. For hadrons, this gets much more complicated because at this level, we have to address the non-compensation of the calorimeter. So we have a very dynamic, very nonlinear correction, which is a function of several observables in the cluster. The out of cluster corrections, because of the EM showers, whereas the large fluctuations in the hadronic showers also are different for both types of showers. And then the dead material corrections, what is lost in the dead material is actually not terribly different, but it's somewhat different because hadrons tend to be have higher mass and have more ionization power than electrons. So there is, and photons, for example, uh, need to do some uh, pair production or something to even, even lose energy. So we, um, we, we have two different strains of calibrations that in the end are put together again, using the likelihood of a cluster to be electromagnetic, which is the first step of the calibration. We, we try to figure out where the cluster comes from. So we use cluster shapes that are proxies for shower shapes, but we also focus on shapes that we can simulate very well because all these calibrations have to be derived, need information from simulation. We, if we had all this in data, we could probably come up with something much simpler, but there is just no reference for a single cluster calibration in data, except for very specific signals. Like uh, if you match a single pion, uh, isolated pion with the cluster response in the calorimeter, you can actually maybe do something. But this, in jets, things have become very different very quickly. So what we decided to do is because we see that the liquid argon has a, um, electronic readout that cancels average and pileup on average, we decided to calibrate our clusters independent of the pileup uh, using single particle simulation, but we apply the reconstruction cuts that are chosen for a certain run period, and those depend on pileup. So when you set the, uh, the noise, the nominal noise you want to use for the cluster formation, you have to decide to which kind of, uh, what kind of, number of uh, additional collisions you have in a bunch crossing. Um, this number is, is never quite true in, the, in real operations because as you know, the proton density goes down with uh, runtime and the number of collisions per bunch crossing goes down. So we, we have to make an educated guess talking to machine people and so forth and get a, some, some kind of average value for that. So if we do the cluster classification, we use several um, observables. One of the is the density, 
of the um, uh, it's the first movement of the cell energy density. And the other one, for example, here is the depth of the cluster measured from the front face of the calorimeter. So we, we have um, we have these two, two observables, and then we see um, we can measure the, elect the electromagnetic probability using the simulations. Um, and you see that below this red line, this is kind of a by I 50% line, you, you get the, the electromagnetic uh, clusters and the hadronic clusters are where the, big, where the dark blue patches. We can see if we do something, so this is all come from simulation, so we should look at it in the data, and we did. And here you see the distribution of the electromagnetic clusters in the jet, where we call a thing electromagnetic if it has more than 50% uh, likelihood to be an electron uh, of electromagnetic origin. Um, then we have hadronic clusters, which are just the other ones in the jet. And these distributions compare quite well between data and Monte Carlo. They're not, not quite perfect, but they compare surprisingly well and was, was very big relief when we saw that in the first data. The calibration itself that takes care of the uh, E over H mostly, the non compensation of the calorimeter. This is done at cell level. So we, we really calibrate, try to get the best calibration for each cell in the cluster. Uh, it depends a lot on the cell energy density. And so we can compare how well is the uh, energy density understood. And we see here some distributions from the hadronic end caps and the forward calorimeter first module. And you see that we have, a, we have an excellent agreement also here in terms, of, uh, in terms of the energy density in cells showing up in clusters and jets. As far as I remember. Yes, those are clusters and jets. Then we have the art of cluster corrections. This is, uh, I really encourage you if you want to know more to read the paper about this. This is a rather complex procedure, uh, but we can again, uh, you can imagine that one of the important things is the isolation of a cluster. If you have single particles and you have only one cluster, then the R of cluster correction should reflect the loss that has been introduced by the clustering. But if you're in a jet, what you lose for one cluster can end up in another cluster because they're close by. So we, we measure actually the isolation of each cluster. And uh, this enters the, the correction. This is the scale factor for the correction. And what you see here, is the, the isolation uh, of the cluster as function of the uh, cluster energy um, in jet events. Uh, again, this is in, in data and Monte Carlo. And you see that uh, lower energy clusters are often slightly more isolated than actually higher energy clusters, which, is, which are in the core of the jet. So they, they are, tend to be closer together. Then the final is the that material correction that is even more complex. It has a lot to do with where you are in the calorimeter. Uh, this is all uh, mapped out. Again, I can only encourage you to read the, the cluster paper, but you can, you can look at this stepwise at what happens if you apply these corrections uh, to data in Monte Carlo. And you see that uh, this is actually uh, a no pileup run. This is a uh, very first data at the LHE, at, uh, 7 TV. And you see that the correction as function of rapidity for clusters inside jets um, has very, very similar shapes. So the corrections reflect very, very well what the, uh, what the detector gives us. Now, the, there, there is this, uh, sometimes this uh, understanding that this is trivial, but it really is not because all corrections are function of several variables um, that have to be considered when you, when, when you want to uh, calculate the correction. And it's not by far non-trivial that these will show up in the same way in data Monte Carlo. This is, a, this is just for summary. So the corrections on a cell in the cluster, this is the cell weight. So if you ever work with clusters, if somebody asks you to get the cells out of the cluster, it's a rarely used in analysis, but sometimes for performance. This is the effective weight on the cluster. It's, it's a product of, of the uh, different steps that are all reflected by weights. And there's uh, always the factor of the EM likelihood that produces the, the contribution of a given uh, branch of the calibration. 
So the last point for today, what is the cluster as the jet input then? Well, um, they are calorimeter only measurements. So we have an energy and the space point in the detector to turn this into something that looks like a four vector. We need to know the vertex, uh, which allows us to convert the energy and space point to energy and direction. And then if we make a rule about the mass of the cluster, then we can even calculate the momentum. So this is what we did. And the four vector of a cluster is given in this uh, little formula. Uh, it comes at two different scales, uh, EM and the local hadronic. And you see that the directions are dependent on the scale because the first step of the calibration, the hadronic calibration applies different weights to different cells. And this makes the origin, you have to resum these cells all the time to get the new four vectors. Uh, so these, these may change, can change the directions. Um, the rule that the mass that the cluster uh, has is massless is um, by definition, if you want, there was a long discussion, uh, but we all agreed that in the end, a cluster, uh, whatever mass a cluster can, can have, and nowadays you have actually a moment, a mass moment for the cluster, you can actually see what the mass of the uh, cluster is when you would sum up the cells um, as four vectors. And, um, but this mass has very little physics meaning, meaning for regular clusters, only in very high density, highly boosted uh, particles. There may, there, there, there seems to uh, be a meaning emerging which relates to the mass of the actual particle. But uh, in, in most clusters have no mass comes down and is defined by the shot development and even more so by the uh, noise cuts we do when we trace this shower. So clearly also, while we can have uh, negative energy clusters or cells with negative energy inside the clusters, we can only use physically meaningful four vectors for all following final state, hadronic final state reconstruction. Actually, they're now, they're also useful the electrons. But um, whatever we want to do next, the cluster has to have a valid four vector. So that's um, my last statement for today. Um, clustering alone, um, from experience, I know it's it's a week worth of material. Um, if you really want to get into it, I can only encourage you to read, to follow up what I attached to these slides. And maybe if you're really getting interested, have a look at the couple cluster paper, which has a, a quite complete overview on on the cluster. Okay, any immediate questions? Well, if not, then I suggest you uh, have another look at these slides. I will post them a little later today. Tomorrow we move on from the clusters to the particle flow project uh, objects, and then um, actually talk about the jet calibration. Um, and after that, I think for this week, we, we, we close with the uh, look at the performance. Um, also jet reconstruction, meaning how we you know, evaluate the quality of our calibration and the related uncertainties, systematic uncertainties. And then we are uh, basically you know, done with the jets in the detector. So if there are no more questions, then I would say we can close for today and uh,